grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And good Wednesday evening or whatever good whatever time you are watching this. You'll notice I don't have a mask on and the reason for that is that uh, I'm pretty much in here by myself and uh, so there's nobody to infect if I am infectious. And um, the other thing, uh, I am not suited up tonight because this is the first Wednesday of August and so we are doing our Wednesday evening prayer services of which the study is a part. So that should have you oriented. Let us worship God. Stay with us, Lord, for it is evening and the day is almost over. God reveals deep and mysterious things and knows what is hidden in darkness. God is surrounded by light. To you, O oh God, we give thanks and praise. Let us pray. Thanks and praise to you, O oh God, for the gift of the revelation of yourself shining at the dawn of creation, guiding us through the wilderness, leading us to the land of promise. You sent Jesus, light of the world, to be our way of truth and life. Help us to follow him each day and rest in him each night until at last we may come to dwell in your eternal realm. So open our ears, our eyes, our hearts to learn how you speak to us so that we may hear and obey. For this we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And so we come to section three on how we read the Bible. But once again, before we um, begin tonight's topic, I want to do a review first of the overview and then of the keys where we have been. We as Presbyterians all agree to the uh, centrality of the Bible in the life of the church. The scriptures are authoritative both for individual faith and for the life of the church. We started out by reviewing two questions, ordination questions that are taken by uh, ministers of the Word and Sacrament and ruling elders in the Presbyterian Church, and the two that have to do with the Bible are these. Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal and God's Word to you? And the other do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what the scripture leads us to believe and to do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? So we have the scripture and we have the confessions of faith, and we have already said that the confessions of faith merely summarize scripture. They certainly do not replace it. The Bible is not the product of one human author, but a number of authors. Uh, you have 66 books between the Old and New Testament not necessarily 66 authors. The first ordination question that we just reviewed uses the phrase, by the Holy Spirit. We believe that the Bible is a living revelation because the Holy Spirit is now alive and active as the Holy Spirit always has been. The Holy Spirit 
inspired people seeing God at work to record that activity and insight. And the Holy Spirit illumines the scripture uh, so that what has been inspired may be properly discerned. Given the inspiration and the illumination of the Holy Spirit, it has pleased God to choose to produce this revelation of the nature and the will of God through the use of human agents. And that's important. Given the inspiration uh, and examination of the scriptures themselves, militates against verbal inspiration. That is God just using someone as uh, Alexa or Siri or voice, some kind of voice writer. Uh, therefore, since it has pleased God to use human, human beings, there is a human element contained within the scripture and understanding these inspired insights along with interpreting them leads us to seek after some principles of interpretation, which I have chosen to call the six keys to unlock the scripture. And so here is the review of the first two that we've talked about. They all begin with C. The first is community. The Holy Spirit has worked and works through the community to establish which among many, many choices are authentic. And it isn't too much of a stress to understand that the most reliable interpretation is how the Holy Spirit speaks to us rather than just to me. This is one significance of the ordination question relating to our confessions because, of course, those have been produced by us. We talked about the second, the 17th century second Helvetic confession, the true interpretation of Scripture. The Apostle Peter has said that the Holy Scriptures are not of private interpretation, and thus we do not allow all personal interpretations. In other words, unlike a lot of what we are prone to do in other areas in the current time, we do not create our own reality into the matter of what God is like and what God wants us to be like. It's an act of the community. The second C is context, the things that shape the product of a human agent, uh, the author, the recipient, the purpose, the historical context, the cultural mindset, the language, the worldview, all of these things go in to why people wrote the way that they wrote. The second Helvetic Confession continues in the section on the true interpretation of Scripture that we just cited. But we hold that interpretation of the Scripture to be orthodox and genuine, which is gleaned from the Scriptures themselves, from the nature of the language in which they were written, likewise according to the circumstances in which they were set down and expounded in the light of like and unlike passages and of many and clearer passages and which agree with the rule of faith and love and contributes much to the glory of God and man's salvation. So there is the, uh, there is the, Word. My phone just went off and it says potential spam, as it so often is. The confession of 1967, which relied on the second Helvetic confession, says this. The scriptures given under the guidance of the Holy Spirit are nevertheless the words of men, conditioned by the language, thought forms, and literary fashions of the times and places in which they were written. 
They reflect the views of life, history, and the cosmos, which were then current. The church, therefore, has an obligation to approach the scriptures with literary and historical understanding. As God has spoken his word in diverse cultural situations, the church is confident that God will continue to speak through the scriptures in a changing world and in every form of human culture. So those say something about what we believe and they and they together encompass a little over 300 years of belief. What I am telling you is not anything new, not for Presbyterians. The above two keys, this community and context, have to do with the way in which the revelation is accomplished. The next key that we're going to talk about tonight has to do with the nature of the revelation itself. And so the, the word starting with C for today is content. Uh, what does the Bible attempt to show and convey to our understanding? Back to that second Helvetic Confession. And in this Holy Scripture, the Universal Church of Christ has the most complete exposition of all that pertains to saving faith and also to the framing of a life acceptable to God. Scripture teaches fully all goodness. We judge, therefore, that from the Scriptures are to be derived true wisdom and godliness, the reformation and government of the churches, and also instruction in all duties of piety, and, to be short, the confirmation of doctrines and the rejection of all errors. Well, building on that, the Westminster Confession of Faith, and we're mid-17th century there, the whole counsel of God concerning the things necessary to and for his own glory, Man's salvation, faith, and life is either expressly set down in Scripture or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from Scripture. So the purpose of the Scripture ultimately has to do, according to the Westminster Confession of Faith, with salvation. Now, while they were at that Confession of Faith, they also wrote two catechisms. Now, a catechism is a series of questions and answers that are uh, intended to uh, teach someone about the nature of the faith. It is a summary. So the larger catechism was produced for use essentially with adults, while the shorter catechism was produced, you guessed it, uh, for children. So from the larger catechism, here's question number three. The question is, what is the word of God? The answer is, the holy scriptures of the Old and New Testaments are the word of God, the only rule of faith and obedience. Question four, how doth it appear that the scriptures are the word of God? And the answer was, the scriptures manifest themselves to be the word of God by their majesty and purity, by the consent of all parts and the scope of the whole, which is to give glory to God, by their light and power to convince and convert sinners, to comfort and build up believers unto salvation, but the Spirit of God, bearing witness by and with the Scripture in the heart of man, is alone able to fully persuade that they are the very Word of God. <clears throat> A lot of words there. Imagine trying to memorize all of that so you could be confirmed in the church. Here, though, this next question, which is question number five, and... It is question number three in the Shorter Catechism, and it uses these same words. This is really key for tonight. What do the scriptures principally teach? And the answer was, the scriptures principally teach what man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man. 
Obviously, that uh, in the larger and shorter catechism, they hadn't heard of inclusive language, but we'll take it as it was written. So, it is then appropriate to ask the question, what are we trying to seek from the scripture? And we have to also add, is what we are trying to discern from Scripture consistent with the historical Reformed understanding of what the Scripture reveals? So, to become a little more practical, what might be missing from the seeking of some by reading the Bible according to these catechisms? Well, there are really three things. First, what is missing is a factual source of secular history. William Barclay, who was a well-known name in the 20th century, but he was a prolific writer and he was a, a brilliant theologian, a little ahead of his time, but in the, his book, Introducing the Bible, he makes this statement. It is quite true that the Jewish idea of history is not that of a professional historian. That is to say that what is given in scripture that purports to be history is not necessarily factual history as we would read it in a book or get it online if you could find a reliable source online or get in a documentary or, or, or whatever. The biblical writers were using this to make a point. And I've often been fond of saying that they really didn't care, particularly the Old Testament writers didn't care doodly squat what actually happened. They told the story to convey the divine revelation that they had. Secondly, what may be missing in some of your seeking or someone seeking in the Bible, according to the catechisms, the Bible is not a textbook of science. The lightning rod has been, still is for that, for some people, is uh, creation. Now, there are for uh, some theories of creation that go from one end of the scale to the other. The first one is fiat creationism. That is, all of a sudden, just things appeared as they are. They didn't have to evolve. They just, one minute, nothing. Next minute, you have a fully complex, um, actually, universe, uh, not to mention the planet. When you move over a little, you move to progressive uh, revelation. That is that God has revealed God's self uh, little at a time. Maybe as God felt that we were able to receive it, but nonetheless that uh, so maybe God revealed a finger here, the elbow was yet to come, and the shoulders are head or whatever was still further down the line. If you move um, over to from progressive revelation, you, you uh, move to theistic evolution. Now, theistic evolution says that God planned everything. He set the worlds in motion, which is a good biblical concept, and he uh, did all of this by the, a design, a divine design and plan and wisdom, but he was not involved at every step, but was, uh, but set it in motion and that it is moving out according to God's plan. That's why it's called theistic evolution. Only when you get completely over to the other side, we started with fiat creationism here, progressive revelation, theistic evolution. Here we have atheistic evolution. Now some people believe if you don't believe on this side, then you necessarily believe on that side. 
The thing is, there's a lot of stuff that is in the middle. Oh, uh, by the way, it is generally thought that Darwin uh, was a believer, though certainly not a 20th or 21st century evangelical Christian when he wrote The Origin of the Species. It was the reaction of uh, the church and the uh, religious forces that kind of drove him from being any kind of believer. The book of Genesis, and it has a purpose, is concerned with theology, seems to be the establishment of the source of all being. That is, Genesis answers the question, who did all of this? And of course, the answer is God. Whereas the theory of evolution is concerned with scientific processes, must be the answer to how. So on the one hand, that Genesis is saying, who did it? God. And evolution is saying, how was it done? Or we could say, how did God do it? If the Bible is being used to answer questions that it was not intended to deal with, then this biblical versus science or creation versus evolution is simply bogus and it is a distraction from the Bible telling us what it was intended to tell us. So it's not a factual source of secular history. It's not a textbook of science. The third thing, misuse, is a roadmap to a defined future. There's some that believe that you can look in the Bible and you can see everything out till the, the end of time. And I'm sure there's some nuts somewhere that are studiously looking into Daniel and or Revelation and trying to figure out where the coronavirus fits in biblical prophecy. The Bible was not intended for that. The context of scripture itself is found in the literature of the ancient Middle East, the tools the authors use for teaching, and the probable reasons for the inclusion of certain things into the Bible. Now, here are some examples where the emphasis on content is blurred. Let's think about the whole first 11 chapters of Genesis. This is a rich mine of basic theology. It is undoubtedly divinely inspired. It is a source of biblical truth as to understanding of who God is and how God acts. But verse, the chapters 1 and 2 are two versions of creation. I mean, two chapters, two versions, and most people think that chapter 2 is older than chapter 1. Go figure. Chapter 3 is an explanation of evil, um, labor for survival, the pain of childbirth, the loathing of snakes. It answers some practical questions uh, that go back to a theological point. Chapter 4 talks about the strife between ranchers and farmers. Uh, and, of course, that we have in there that uh, concept of what was east of Eden. Uh, you know, there were some people out there. there and uh, so the question is, if Eden was all there was to it, then, you know, what was east of Eden and, and uh, where did the people that populate it come from? If you come into Genesis chapter 6 through 9a, you have the flood, the attempt to remove evil, the explanation of the rainbow as the sign of the covenant. And the question has to come from looking at this, if God, this, this infinite, omniscious, omniscient, all-knowing, an all-powerful God, if God and, and knew what was going to happen, why did God bother to kill everything on earth in the first place? 
or, uh, you know, or did God miss Q? Um, chapters 9b through 10 explains the origin of races and the justification, or not a justification, but an explanation of prejudices that arise. Um, chapter 11 is an explanation of different languages and uh, human strife coming out of it. And it gives a good definition of sin because it said that human strife caused by people trying to feather their own nest, to attend to their own interests, to make a name for themselves, as it says there. There are also other books um, in there. The book of Job, um, Explanation of Evil. Is that what Job, is this an explanation of evil or is this a sermon about confronting evil? Genesis 37, that's uh, Ezekiel's vision on the valley of the dry bones. The thing about it is, the question is, is this an actual happening or is it a vision? Well, the scripture says it's a vision. Some people ignore that and want to figure out how the uh, neck bone was connected to the whatever bone and the dry bones rose again. Ezekiel 37 is one of those things that is not purported to be uh, a secular historical event. Jonah, uh, a biography of one, uh, is that a biography or is it one of the finest satires in all of literature? Uh, the books of Daniel and Revelation, I mentioned that just a while ago, are these literal visions, literal happenings, or, or they, are they masterpieces of apocalyptic literature? And by the way, both of them are written in apocalyptic literature, which was a very popular kind of history in the ancient uh, East. As we get to the New Testament, we see that Jesus made frequent use of parables, many of them probably based upon some actual occurrence. The question is, do we allow God's spirit and God's secretaries to use the same tools in the Old Testament as Jesus freely used in the New Testament? I have a friend who's an English major and that um, uh, she was telling me that uh, there is a book, Why English Majors Make Lousy Fundamentalists. Well, the reason that was given is because that English majors deal with the nature and the dynamics of literature itself and said there are clues in the literature that tells you this isn't been intended to be factual. So the question has to then come, are we dealing with progressive revelation or are we dealing with a maturing human perception? For instance, let's look at some New Testament images of God, which sets up something, another key that we're going to come back to. Uh, Luke 15, verses 1 through 33, this triad of parables that try to define the, the nature of God and the nature of God that was quite different than uh, the Pharisees, some of the most religious people of the time. Or the first chapter of the Gospel of John, which talks about the Word becoming flesh and living among us full of grace and truth. Uh, or of John 3, 16 and 17, that talks about God so loved the world that he gave his only son, which is quite a contrast to God who destroys the world back there in the flood. And then John 14, verses 8 through 12 where the disciples say to Jesus, show us the Father. And Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. But we're going to talk about that one maybe uh, next week. So we ask again, what do the scriptures principally teach? Is the Bible a revelation 
or is it a manual of codes? Uh, we started out with Ten Commandments. Then extra biblically, but within Jewish writing, the, you let the religious people and the lawyers get hold of it, and they turn that into 613 specific laws. And then Jesus comes along and puts it back, not even into Ten Commandments, but into two. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. From the 17th century, anyway, we're primarily seeking an understanding of the nature and character of God and God's will for us. The priorities we hold, the way we live, and particularly our interactions with other human beings. And if our focus is otherwise, we are in danger of misusing the Bible with all of the certitude and the passion that we might try to bring to it. So we are back at this summary of principles yet again. We're seeking the norms within the forms, and that really, really is key. Let's go to God in prayer. Let my prayers rise before you as incense, O Lord, the lifting up my hands as an evening sacrifice. We lift our voices in prayer and praise, holy God, for you have lifted us to new life in Jesus Christ, and your blessings come in generous measure. Especially we thank you for the good news of Jesus Christ for all, for the wonder and the beauty of creation, for the love of family and friends, for the kindness of strangers, for opportunities for faithful service. And we thank you for the particular blessings of this day. We hold up before you human needs, O God of compassion, for you have come to us in Jesus Christ and shared our life so that we may share his resurrection. Especially tonight do we pray for the one holy Catholic and apostolic church that preserves and proclaims your truth. We pray for peace and justice in the world and first of, and foremost in our minds in our own nation. We pray for those in whom we see Christ's suffering, those who offer Christ's compassion, and we bring before you the particular concerns of this day, which we now name before you in silence. As you have made this, O God, you also make the night. Give light for our comfort. Come upon us with quietness and still our souls, that we may listen for the whisper of your spirit and be attentive to your nearness in our dreams. Empower us to rise again to new life to proclaim your praise and show Christ to the world, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And so may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with us all. And let us all say, Amen.